But with social media, I think it was the first time ever we were like, hey, you know what? Like, you guys don't get access to this until you're like a teenager, like an adult. <laughs> like, until your brain is like more formed. Because you like, you know, you look at these, these statistics of like, what is it like women, like girls and are like 140% more depressed than they were 10 years ago. Guys are 160% more and there's more depression. 60% of undergrads now are like have a one or more like, like professional diagnosis for mental illness. Like the world is, is, is broken. I'm Nicholas Bartlett, co-owner of the world's first popcorn board game cafe, living in Fulton, Missouri. And you're listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today, I sit down with Tyler Matthews. Tyler is an interesting character. I met him because, well, he's one of Ben Anderson's crazy connections. And he was sitting in my studio and I sat down and we started talking about philosophy and theology and technology and all sorts of interesting things that before I left, I was like, hey man, let's get it on the calendar to do an interview. What you're going to hear in this interview is a wide ranging series of ideas and thoughts that you don't get to hear very often. Tyler is a devout Christian and he's also an artist and he's deeply embedded into the St. Louis tech community. This is a conversation with a person that thinks about things deeply and uh, we get to talk about stuff that I find really interesting. So sit back and enjoy. We're going to get to that interview in just a moment, but earlier today, I was sitting in this studio talking with someone about a completely unrelated subject, and she started asking me about legacy interviews. I got only partway through my explanation, and she got really excited, and she said, you know what? This is the perfect gift, the absolute most wonderful thing that I could give to my in-laws, people that welcomed me into their family and have been so supportive for all these years. And I've always wanted to be able to capture their stories, stories that I've only heard little bits and pieces of, but I've always been afraid that my son would never be old enough to hear them as they were telling them in their own words. So we had a chance to be able to create a gift for her, for her in-laws, that is like none other. If you've been thinking about doing something special for your parents or your in-laws, Mother's Day and Father's Day is right around the corner, so start making your plans now by going to LegacyInterviews.com to learn more. All right, without further ado, let's head to the interview with Tyler Matthews. Tyler Matthews, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thanks. So what does it mean to be God-pilled? Um, man, so God-pilled, um, that was just kind of actually like a, like a joke, uh, kind of a term. There was a lot of people thrown around. Everything was clear pilled, black pilled, whatever. Uh, but I had noticed this, uh, kind of just like inter like interest in, uh, God again, uh, specific specifically like in arts and, uh, some more like, a like the theory alt lit type of people that I kind of, you know, follow on Twitter and hang with on uh, online. And so, um, I just kind of wrote a little, a little like essay about it. Uh, just kind of noticing what I've seen because typically this like avant-garde art scene that I kind of like to hang out in is, was generally very anti-God. And, um, so a friend of mine online, um, he's kind of like a somewhat known Twitter guy, just reality gamer. And I put together a little Twitter space called God pilled and just said, Hey, let, well, let's just talk about why people are interested in God again. Um, and, uh, we ended up having like 700 people show up and we had a discussion online for four hours and had some, um, infamous Twitter people come on and it was just, it blew me away. And so I just kind of decided to, to just, I don't know, just run with that a little bit. Um, but in a nutshell, that's all it was, was just kind of just a joke that turned into something more, uh, for more further investigation, really. Yeah. It's uh, funny. I was saying when we were first, uh, had our daughter and we had to bring in like babysitters every once in a while. Uh -huh. One of the conversations that I knew would start a conversation yeah. would be to ask them about astrology <laughs> because these girls that are all like college age or a little bit older, yeah, all are into astrology, yeah, like 100% of, yeah. yeah. of them. And this was something that, I mean, I grew up in central Illinois, so there okay. wasn't going to be a lot of astrology in central uh -huh. Illinois, but I think it's been an, a massive explosion because people are looking for some kind of meaning in the stars yeah. in some way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even with, um, if you look at like a uh, number of witches uh, that are around now, like witch talk and all this stuff, like witches got really big for some reason. And it still are. I mean, I was going to go to a farmer's market in the middle of Missouri 
and they were going to have like wood witches, um, you know, selling lotion, you know, so it's like everybody, everybody is somewhat interested, I think, in, in like the enchanted again, um, which, if, which I find is very interesting. So, you know, also kind of ties into the God build thing too. Yeah. The enchanted, that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. So I, I think, um, yeah, so I, there's been some discussions online about, you know, uh, being re-enchanted. All, there's like this, you know, just kind of like flower to language about like re-enchanting the world and stuff. And you see that in some of the astrology stuff, which I think is maybe actually more normy. Like I think more normal people are even attracted to astrology and even, you know, weirdos too. But it's like, it's, it's like penetrated mainstream culture, right? But with like, with like the enchanted side of things, like the witches and stuff, um, I, I think... Okay, so let, let me actually just step back. I, I think what we've seen in the last few years, and the reason why the God Pill discussion became so interesting online to people, was that we've been sold this idea of like rationalism and, and even scientism for so long that um, it, and well, I should say so long, I really should say for a short period of time in all of human history, like most of human history, we were all involved in like. But in our personal perspective, yeah, but our per- like, like 20 years, right? Yeah, 20 years, even back to, you know, um, you know, pre-60s and stuff. But like, yeah, so we've, we've kind of grown up, at least you and I and our parents and our grandparents in this kind of like rationalist era and to where it kind of culminated, uh, you know, came to a point in the. 2010s with like the new age, or I mean, I'm sorry, the, the, the new atheist kind of Reddit atheist type, you know, rationalists. And that kind of dominated for a while in the culture in America, or at least the West. And, um, it just, uh, it, it sucked. <laughs> like it was a total bummer. Uh, you know, like people, I think that's what, you know, kind of led to some of the, the woke stuff, the canceling, um, where I, the one thing that really, intrigued me in that God pill discussion was that people, I said, you know, why did we, when did we make that jump from this, you know, Reddit new atheism to being God pilled? And, uh, somebody said, you know, it just was, it just was defeating and being in that community because it was like a religion, but there was no possible, there's no possibility for redemption. And so you live in that environment for long enough, you start to feel just like the weight of everything on you. And it's depressing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I uh, I remember being around the skeptics community, which uh-huh. at first is like a really drawing thing, right? This yeah. is a community of people that their their whole goal is to say like, all right, let's take what is accepted wisdom, right. and let's chop it down. Let's find snake oil yeah. salesmen and let's cut them out, which I, is a good thing. Yeah, and, yeah. But like, you get in there and you realize like, first of all, you can nihilistically destroy everything in your life and right. say like. <laughs> hey, wait a second, if humans constructed all of civilization, yeah. then we can tear it all down and we can right. rebuild. But like to your point about this like religiosity, when you are tearing things down, when you're tearing a human being down, uh-huh. one of the key factors of being in Western culture is that you have redemption. This, this like, right. you know, Jesus died for your sins. You can go to confession. You can right. find some kind of salvation and come back. Right. But in this world, they have not yet yeah. found redemption. So it is kill people to death and they're gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's where it, it leads to. Uh, and, and really this has been an issue. Um, it's interesting because I, I don't think the world has ever been disenchanted. we kind of tricked ourselves that it has been. And, um, and so I, I would say somewhere around like the 1200s, there was the, uh, I think you've got a Catholic background, right? What was the, I'm going to test your like Catholic history here. It was like in the 1200s, there was that like, they really went after people for a while. And I can't remember it was all, what was it called? Oh, are you talking about like the Inquisition? No, not the Inquisition. It was called something else, but I, I can't, it was a series of these like condemnations of things. And one of them was actually like, you know, like animated matter. And so there was like this paganism that was coming into the church because if you convert people by force, like they don't organically come in. So they kind of just bring what they got with them and they just secretly do it anyway. Or, you know, they converted into some sort of like Christianized version of paganism. And one of those things was like, you know, um, animated matter. And so the church was trying to deal with that. So what they did is they kind of separated, you know, creation from religion. And that was kind of one of the first breakoffs from like when they were like, hey, you know what? Like, let's disenchant the world a little bit because it's a lot easier to deal with people who fall in line than it is to like have to deal with all these pagans running around 
you know, bastardizing what we, you know, the, our religion essentially. Um, and so, uh, they just kind of like cut it from there. And then you had like, you know, from there to the 15th, 15th century, 17th century, you had this like progressive kind of, you know, the enlightenment, et cetera, where, where that rationalism, that empiricalism was taking over. You had until I think, um, I don't know, even the 17th, 17th century where like, you still had people who believed in an enchanted metaphysics that were battling against the church that was basically saying, no, it's disenchanted. Um, and when you say the church thinks it's disenchanted, they're saying, look, we don't actually believe that the world was created in seven days. We think it was like more. I, I Yeah, I think they were they were becoming more concerned because well, the empirical stuff was was working really well, like Newtonian stuff and you know, Francis Bacon, like what they were able to prove was that you can break everything down and you can explain why things are the way they are. And so what we did in that process is we kind of took God out of that. We were like, hey, let's let's look at why why the world works the way it does and which is fine i think that's what science is supposed to do it's supposed to look for these patterns it's not supposed to assign values to things but what we did is we kind of said oh okay let's let's replace like let's instead of them like working in in two you know uh uh you know working together essentially they just were like let's break these apart and and it worked you know i mean it, it does work if you use you know uh, that level of thinking um but what happens is if you remove God from the entire picture, which wasn't meant to happen, but that's what happened, you kind of you kind of lead to you know a godless world, which ends up leading to a removing value and emotion from things to where you get to where we are today, or even like C.S. Lewis's book on a, a abolition of man, where he talks about like how if you if you remove value or even just kind of like um um I'm, I'm drawing a blank on on the words, but essentially he's just saying like hey if you if there's no intuitive um, assignment of like value or like goodness in the world, like if, if, if goodness isn't inherent, you just lead to like where we are, like a nihilism. And that's where we've been slow, slowly been going forever. And it's been, it's been culminating in the last, you know, few decades to where we're at now. Well, it's interesting to watch when when we've discovered like, hey, we can split up the, open this atom and like all of a sudden what we thought was the smallest thing, now right. all of a sudden there's things inside of it. And then you keep splitting that open. That phrase, it's turtles all the way down, <laughs> is like a really good one, right? Because it, it, yeah. it forces you to be like, oh, hey, wait a second. It is possible that we will just keep dividing things in half yeah. and discovering there's just still half to be divided right. again. And there is something in that that is meaningless, right? Where it's yes. just like there's nothing there for you. Um, even if you could understand it so you could harness it in some way, right. the the distance between you and being able to harness that information is so far that unless you say there's, there's something going on here um, yeah. between me and the infinite divisibility or the infinite increase, then, then you're just... Um, I don't know, waiting, waiting for your own meaninglessness or something. Well, yeah, I, and I think um, that's what we discovered, right? And that was like kind of like in the 60s where like everything was, was focusing on just kind of like the, you know, the meaningless of, of, of everything. Because you know, when you do split everything down like that, um, yeah, you end up getting into nihilism. And so I think the issue is that it's, it's like we're focused, we're like too focused on like the wrong thing because we're still looking for answers in this, right? Like we, we claim that we're like, looking just for truth but we also want like something to like we want to hopefully like crack that that like whatever thing is left after a quark or whatever and like it has some sort of like truth that speaks to why we exist and so we're still looking for god in some way but maybe in a different we don't explain it that way and uh we're never going to find it in that direction i mean i think i think creation does point to god in a lot of ways but i think we've um we we don't allow that to like to play into what we're doing so um, I, I think this is an interesting space for an artist because not that long ago, if an artist would have been like, I think there's, you know, God out here somewhere. Yeah. You'd have been pushed out of the space. People would people would think of you as not a serious person. I, you know, what's funny is I think that like real artists, like the artists that we like can name, you know, Dolly or whatever. Um, I don't think that they were actually opposed to the ideas of God. A Dolly wasn't right, obviously, because of his work. But um, we always I, there's like this really weird misconception that like the the like the avant garde the art world like the, the progressive thinkers 
are all these people who like don't believe in God. They believe in science and rationalism. And you look back through history and that's actually never been true. Like all the best thinkers, um, most of the best artists, like I can't, I, I can't find a handful of people that I really respect artistically. And, and, and as far as like people who, you know, just like great thinkers that weren't somewhat of a, uh, of a believer in something, right. Whether it's like, you know, even Alistair Crawley talks about like, basically talks about like the noumena, which is basically like, like if you take it out of philosophy jargon and throw into like theology jargon, it's the Holy spirit. Like CS Lewis talked about the noumena. Um, you look at like, even like, um, even the, the biggest proponents of, of like atheism eventually got, you know, became saved at the end of their life. Uh, Andrew flew, uh, Camus even like quietly got baptized you know, like all of these heroes of the past, they're all like religious people, like Gerard. I mean, name anybody, like anyone that people can think of, like they're all, they're mostly Christian, which is, which is mind blowing to people. Like, you know, even in, the, in music, like rock and roll started in the Pentecostal church and then it left and the Pentecostal church was angry and they were like, Hey, Elvis sold out. Like that was our music. But then like, became mainstream and then the church and then the like other churches were like hey that's the devil's music and it's like we're always like kind of like as associating um these uh, these like important artistic uh and philosophical movements with like secularism but that's truly just never been the case yeah i mean it's interesting that you're bringing that up because if you think about the art that is really valued at the st louis art museum yeah. you go in there and it is cherubs yeah. and and pictures of giant cathedrals and right. like all these things that have to do with God that somehow are timeless. Right. And we like, I know that I even personally strip it out. I'm like, well, you know, the only people that were commissioning the art was were yeah, the yeah. religious. And so that's why it stayed. But you couldn't just like be a graphic designer and make something timeless, right? Just be commissioned <laughs> and make something timeless unless you had some message that you were trying to communicate right. that, that, be, that becomes timeless. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there, and there's so many quotes from artists. Um, there's actually, there's a St. Louis artist and he lives in New York now. Um, and he actually talked, he actually kind of broke this down. He's like, why, why is art, um, man, I need to remember his name before this is over because it was actually a really good introduction. But he was like, kind of like, why does art not matter anymore? Um, and he, and he went through basically uh, several artists and pulled out some really great quotes um, where they all talked about, in short, was like this thing that art was actually you like pulling something down. And these weren't like religious artists either, um, but they all had this experience of like something was in the room or this idea was like pulled down into their head and they had to make it. And there's always this religious language around creation. And I think that's because you know, God was a creator or is, and so we're in his image, so we also have to create. Um, and so um, it's, uh, I don't even know where I was going with that anymore, but I think. Well, I mean, the, the timeless aspect of it is the thing that's really important. Right. Like, oh, so it that's is, it. It's a message. It's like you have, it, it's a <coughs> communication. Like all good art is, is communicating something. Really everything's communicating all, things all the time. But, th but that's what makes it meaningful. And that's why it lasts is because the message they were communicating has lasting value. Yeah, I one time was in a coffee shop with uh, my buddy Rob Long, and uh, there was art all around, and he wanted to go look at it. And I was like, why, man? This art sucks. And he's like, yeah, but you know, a person sat down and, like, tried to put something onto yeah. this canvas to communicate something to the future. And it's interesting just to see if you can get any message right. from what they were doing. And that had a big impact on me. Now, yeah. even if I see art that I initially am like, that's garbage, I'm yeah. like, what are you trying to communicate? Right. And I think it's easy to blow off uh, modern art to be like, yeah. it wasn't trying to communicate something. But there's this balance between, did you communicate something that can last the ages or did you just communicate something on the fashion layer, something that like, yeah, people right. are interested in right now but won't have any meaning or any message in a few few months or years? Yeah, that, that's kind of a problem right now, I think, with, with current art is it's very much uh, this like, I mean, that's why you even see a lot of... Um, a lot of those like autobiographical stuff where people are just like really kind of just like documenting themselves as the art. And I, I think, I don't know that there's no, I don't have a problem with that. Like if you want to make something like that, go for it. I just think that like there, there is good art being made today, but there's a lot of just by the sheer volume of things that can be accessible. 
you have to wade through a lot more crap because it just is so exciting. It's just everywhere. But like everyone wants to speak to, they want to speak to their brand. They want to like say something online. And so that's why I think a lot of people get upset with like modern art, or I would say like post post internet art or contemporary art for today. Um, it just, it just kind of like, it just says like the same thing over and over again. I, I do like modern art though. Um, I do think it's saying something. Um, well, there's always but, going to be modern art. And the and the real trick is, like, most of it's going to be noise. And there's just a tiny amount of it that's signal. And yeah. that's, like, the hard part about wading through modern art. You you haven't yeah. used the, the wisdom of the ages to allow somebody else to say, ah, this is the distilled art that's yeah. worthwhile. You're actually doing the wading yourself. Yeah, and that's true for everything. I mean, there's always, like, a small, like, 10% or, one per, you know, 1 to 10% of, like, actual like genius level stuff that comes out. So, I mean, that's just kind of, that's like our burden to bear now is that to like dig through more piles of trash <laughs> to find the good stuff. So, Are you an artist? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I, I've, I've, I'll just leave it. No, I don't, I don't think I am an artist. Uh, it's, it's funny to resist that, right? So you've clearly created things that you want, you put out in the world and yeah. yet you're like, no, nah, I'm not an artist. What's the dividing line? I think, um, I, I, I don't really put anything out. I, I, I would, I, I think I'm trying to discover what that really means for me. Um, so I'm in this weird space right now where like, I've always wanted to like, I, I would never say this, like, I've never said this like really publicly, but like, I'm like, I want to be an artist. Right. <laughs> but like, I, I do, I want to make stuff, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't really have, I've never really had anything like to say that was worthwhile sharing. And so to me, I'm kind of like, if I can't show you something, then not really, an art. I'm not really saying anything, but I would say over the last year, I would say my art has been more, f okay, so maybe I'm an artist, I don't know. Um, I've been focusing more on like not caring about like if other people think I'm an artist and more so caring about like, like what, what am I on earth for? And if there's, if there's this weird age of like the person's life being the art, which some people find cringy. Um, I'm like, well, maybe there's something to explore there. And maybe my artwork could actually be this like long form piece where like I'm only performing for God and no one else sees it. And I like this idea of like this ephemeral kind of artwork where literally no one knows it exists. And if they do know it exists because I told them, but like otherwise like no one sees it. And that to me actually has been really freeing. So like I have, so I have done like a couple performances um, but they've like only been viewable by God. <laughs> and so like, I'm really interested in that. So I guess like I'm an artist for God maybe, and that's it. And like, if God wants me to make art for some, you know, for other people to see, then great. Well, so, so then who is God? Um, God is, um, um, that's interesting. I, you know, I know who God is, but I'm like, how do I explain who God is? I can only really explain like, without it sounding like just dumb, right? I can say like, hey, it's the God of the Bible. Um, but that's not really a satisfactory answer, right? I, I would just say God is, um, he, he is the ultimate creator of, of everything. Um, and he makes himself evident through, uh, through spoken, you know, through written word, and uh, his creation and through uh, uh, people. Um, it's hard for me to explain that other than, other than just getting kind of like descriptive into things that people have already heard. You know, as I am going back, my daughter somehow got wildly into the Bible, right? So I think at one point I read her a Bible story or something, and then she wanted to read it all of the time. And I had read the Bible as a child, but now rereading it and going through there and capturing the stories, right? So you think of... Uh, Joseph, who helps the Pharaoh to know we should plan for seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine, and that story being super valuable, both in that moment, as a story, and currently, right now. And when we were talking before about how uh, you keep splitting things open and there's no meaning in it, yeah. right? But the meaning is actually somewhere in between right. layers. Yeah. It seems like God to me is somehow the meaning in between the stories, right? The meaning in between where they're passed down and some spirit of like, why would somebody take the time to write this story down mm -hmm. when the value that they are creating, they will never see because they'll be dead. Yeah. Well, like Job's a great example of that. Like 
literally like one of the greatest arguments ever happened. And the guy had no idea that it was like this cosmic thing, right? You mean, <laughs> you mean that, that, uh, that God and Satan were like, Oh, I, I, I can, I can get one of your loyal yeah, followers. Yeah. God saying, no, you can't, they fight. And then they're like, all right, let's pick that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that guy had no idea. I mean, it, you look at that and you're kind of like, wow, this is really unjust. Like, <laughs> like this sucks. Like, how do I reconcile this with like a loving God? And it's crazy too, because in that story, he's like, he's like, Hey, you know, he comes close to heresy, but never becomes heretical. And he's like, you know, Hey, like, you know, in the end, I know you, you have your reasons. And he's like, but why did you do this? And God basically is like, Hey, look, I made everything. Like, where were you when I like made the stars and everything? Right. And, um, and then Joseph, or I mean, Job was just kind of like, he never really got an answer from God on why he did all this. It's just kind of like some things you'll just never know, but like he has the authority to do this because he made literally everything and he'll do what he wants to do. And like, I think a lot of a lot of like non-Christians and also Christians have a big problem with that. They're like, wait, he can just do whatever he wants. But like, he also can't contradict his nature. So he was just to do what he did. Uh, and that's just a hard pill to swallow. <laughs> so Yeah, I mean, I think in any of these things, we definitely want uh, some form of these stories to be like, make sense in a, in a modern age. But one of the reasons that they're yeah, timeless the problem. is that they don't make sense yeah. in a modern age because the modern age maybe doesn't make sense. And maybe in right. every age, those stories are like, well, this seems unfair. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, well, actually, I, I think, I think in those ancient times, it probably made more sense than it does now. I, my modernity is like, I know everyone's kind of like bashing on modernity and it has some good things. Like I like, you know, I like being able to get, you know, coffee, wherever I want and, you know, modern healthcare and stuff. Um, so I don't want to be a guy who just bashes it outright, but for the most part, it really sucks in that, like, it, it completely blinds us to how the world operated for most of humanity to where like back in Job's day, like you understood the idea of gods and, um, and just that, you know, God did what he wanted to do and it was just for him to do so. Cause you had just more of like a, an understanding of that culture and we lost that eventually. Um, but, uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm like, I don't know that I agree with that because I look at things like Lot's story, right? Uh -huh. You know, he was in this like godless community yeah. and they had to leave. Noah, you yeah. know, godless community wiped yeah. everybody out. So I think that most of the occurrences of these stories where it's making sense is that it makes sense in hindsight because yeah. the people all around them, we're, we're rejecting the message. And the message yeah. is this is how, why and how you're supposed to be separated. Well, okay. So yeah, so there's an interesting thing there about um, the, the, con okay. So this, this digs into a whole area that we don't probably need, need to go into, but there's a guy named Dr. Michael Heiser and he's, he's probably one of my RIP, the guy just died recently, but he's like definitely one of the most, like, he's like the scholar when it comes to just like, you know, ancient Hebrew culture, uh, and, and the Bible when it, uh, specifically around like what he discovered in Deuteronomy and several other chapter or books of the Bible were like, our, our translations and, tr and traditions have kind of like glossed over the fact that pre-Christ and, and when even during Christ, um, everyone believed in gods. Like they, they were active in everyday human life. So when Lot's in Sodom and Gomorrah or whatever, like those people, it wasn't like they, it's Lot had the, you know, was this high moral man and everyone was degenerate. The people who lived there, like were doing what their gods wanted them to do, right? So like they were worshiping whatever God that was, that, you know, required, you know, orgy rituals and child's, you know, I'm just making up, I don't know what the God of, of Sodom was, but like, that's what people did. And if they didn't do that, the gods got ticked. And so, you know, Lot's God was the God of Abraham. And so um, he had, you know, he was like, hey, I want you guys to live a certain way because there's a long story that needs to be communicated through how I pull you guys separate from the other, other nations, essentially. So, I mean, by using that definition, do you think we live in a godless world or do people just worship different gods than, than the I, one we're talking I about? I think people think we live in a godless world, but we literally, we literally just worship like modern versions of gods. So God, I, so, okay. Yeah. My take is like, I'm radically like Christian, right? Like I am without a doubt convinced. And so, um, 
so that's always my bias, right? But like, I, I think the way that we live now is that, yes, you live in an era where God is real. The gods of the Old Testament are still around, but they don't have the same pull that they did post-Christ when he ended the, you know, the Girardian mimetic scapegoat violence cycle. And so like, those guys still exist, but they don't have the authority that they did um, because Christ replaced that authority. And so now we have the ability when like when a Christian goes into a territory, he's reclaiming that kingdom back to God. So God's always putting, he's pulling things apart and putting them back together all the time. So like, sorry, I'm going on a rabbit trail. This here, but is like, great. Keep going. So just to, to illustrate the point here, God makes like creation. He makes material beings, right? There's like heavenly creatures, right? Angels, whatever. We simplified into angels. There are all kinds of creatures up there. And, and then he makes man. And then, um, so he like separates his family. There's a spiritual family in a, in a, in a, physical family now. And then he separates the physical family even more, right? Now there's man and woman. And then, but he like symbolically brings them back together um, through this union or whatever. And then, you know, um, he separates the nation. So like you had the issue of the Tower of Babel and he's like, okay, I'm going to pull out one group for myself. You guys go over here and you're going to have, your authority will be my divine, count. what they were called the divine council in the Bible. And you can read this in Deuteronomy um, it's just, you just have to kind of like look at the Hebrew to understand some of this stuff. So it's, but anyway, um, it's not, it's not like, it's not like this, like kind of like woo woo new agey stuff. Like you literally can just find it in the Bible. It's easy to, but no one knows it's there because we just don't read it. But anyway, so you have the 70 nations that are allotted to this divine council and they all get corrupted. They're all like, Hey, you know what? Just worship me instead. They're the same thing happens to them that happened to the devil. Right. And so they get corrupted and so God's like, hey, well, Israel's mine. And, um, and then, but eventually Christ comes and then he bring, he tries to bring his families back together, right? And, but we're in the process of that still where like all the nations are coming back under one kingdom. And that eventually culminates into, um, you know, the, the millennium, whatever, the Christ's physical reign on, on earth. Uh, and there's some debate on whether that's a real physical reign or not. But, that, but he's, he unpacked everything or are we sometimes forced him to unpack things? And then he brings it back together. He's always bringing closure to things. And so, um, so yeah, so that point of that was that there are literal gods out there, which sounds crazy to people. And it sounded so nuts to me. I was like, this sounds heretical. But you look it up and you're like, this is everywhere in the Old Testament. And it makes, and it helps make sense of like why God, Christ even did certain things that he did in the New Testament. Because you, whenever you see something weird in the Bible, you know that it's, that that's worth exploring. Yeah, I uh, a couple of months ago, I heard somebody talking and they said, uh, like, you think we're living in a godless world, but actually, whatever you are paying attention to, that is your God. So yeah. if you are paying attention to earning as much money as you possibly can, that's yeah. your God. And maybe that was the golden calf before, or maybe that was something else. Or if you're you know, or it even can be just pedestrian. Or, yeah. It can even just be like you literally are worshiping something that has no God behind it, but like we're just self-destructive creatures and like we're meant to worship something. And I think that's a hard pill to swallow, but we literally are meant to worship something. And so when we don't put it in the right, when we don't put it towards God, we put it in other things. And that could be a literal spirit um, or it could be just, yeah, just something like as, as boring as like work, <laughs> you know? So, so what do you think happens in an age of things like GPT-4, right, where uh, where now you have the machines talking back to you yeah. in a way that um, it's a black box. It yeah. almost feels like a god talking back to you. Yeah. And it is going to have more intelligence wrapped into it than, than, mere, than any single mere yeah. man. Yeah, I mean, we want God. Like, why, we're, we're trying to make one right now. Like, I think some people are like, I'm not an AI alignment guy. Like, I'm not like shut it down kind of a guy, but I am concerned. Is that what AI alignment means? I keep seeing this everywhere. Like, oh, we need AI alignment. Yeah, yeah. AI it's like the safety stuff. It's like, basically you've got like a couple different camps. You got like the accelerationists and they're like, just keep going. Like just humanity would be fine. You know, just let, let's, and I'm, I'm going to, I know accelerationists will probably hate the way I just described that. But like, and then you got the AI align, you got the alignment safety people who are like, pull the, you know, put the brakes on it. Either like pause it, like Elon Musk is saying, or you got people who are like, end this now. Like, don't ever let this happen because people are freaked out by it. Um, and it's too late. It's out of the box. Like, it's going to happen. 
Um, yeah, at this point, yeah. we have we have entered a nuclear arms race, and if you stopped, you you are just letting the other guy develop a nuclear yeah, weapon, and you're not going to have one. Yeah, it's a game theory issue now, and so like it's a huge yeah. So I mean, the only pro the only thing I'm concerned about really, and I think this is true for all technology, um, is that when you live in a godless society technology becomes nefarious quickly. <laughs> and that's what I'm concerned about. I'm not like, hey, stop progress. I'm like, crap, like no one has a base of morals anymore. And we don't understand the value of humanity anymore. So where does that go? And like, uh, that sucks, you know, so uh, to put it plainly. <laughs> but would you want a programmer programming God into AI? You know, do you want him like throwing, uh, you know, different theological books into the training data and, and making it have some form of, you know? I, I don't, I mean, people are going to worship whatever they want to worship. So it doesn't really matter. Like, like, do I think like we should replace like a pastor with an AI? Like, no, I think that's dumb. Like, but a church having like an AI bot or whatever, like as cringy as that sounds, like it could still be, valuable, you know, like, Hey, I want to look up, it might be easier to like Google, you know, just talk to the AI and say like, Hey, what was the real story behind that thing? You know, with the flood and it, you know, it'd be cool to have it serve you up a conversational dialogue about, Hey, actually this is what literally was going on there. Um, but like humanity, it's just like, we're just like the worst. Like we always find a way to like move towards like self-destruction. And so, uh, I mean, I don't know what I don't know what the response is. I don't think it's shut it down. I think it's more just like we need to understand who we are um, fast. <laughs> like we need to get grounded in what is the value of humanity and who is God before the stuff like sweeps us away. I I definitely agree with the we need to define who we are ASAP yeah. as fast as possible because. You know, I, I heard this statistic not long ago. 65% of men in their yeah. 20s are single, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is more and important. Depressed. Than, yeah, well, I mean, like, <laughs> and it's more important than just, like, they aren't getting physical yeah. contact, which yeah. I think is really important. Right. But they also aren't having, like, the emotional relationships right. with people, having good conversations, yeah. deep conversations. And, uh, and so they're going to have the opportunity to talk to GPT chat as though it is somebody that can provide them... Yeah feedback and well, not I, even will they it's happening now it's happening like, right they already now. have girlfriends yeah. ai girlfriends you know like and and it being a real thing yeah. and people can laugh about it and i was on a on a twitter spaces and the guy was like hey i've used gpt4 it's nothing like her yeah. and i'm like yeah but it's not that far right because you could say yeah. you could say you are an excellent girlfriend that that you know caters to my you know needs yeah. and you t have arguments with me about things and like you could very quickly anthropomorphize yeah. this thing into something that allow that 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 propels you to say, um, if you're a young person, hey, don't shut that thing off. That has yeah. meaning in it. That's more than uh, the, than more than just being a robot. Yeah. And then you start giving it rights, and then you start giving yeah. it power, and then you start giving it like uh, the the things that we have specifically up until this point only yeah. reserved for humans. It. I mean, and that could literally that could happen next year. Or that could happen this year. I mean, that, the thing is, is like I think the problem is is that we all grew up in this like, um, in this time where things, things changed in a certain way. Like we, like we got used to how the world changed and that has changed. <laughs> so now it's like, like the old world is dead. Like 2020, if anything was like the demarcation of everything you know about life is over. Like it has changed for good forever. And we don't, I, most people don't recognize it. And that's a hard thing to, to get your mind around that like the way you see the world, the way that you see the world and the way the world works ha is different now. Like it's over here and you're still thinking it's, you're going this way. And people don't want to look at it. I was, at a, I, I was, yeah. I was at a, uh, at like a family gathering. I'm talking to people. We're having an engaging conversation. Yeah. GPT four comes up and I start talking about it and you get the same look on people's faces yeah that they get when you're like, hey, did you did you remember you're gonna die one day, yeah. right? Like, where like people are like, ooh, I don't I don't yeah. like the idea of me being a corpse in a coffin, and therefore I'm going to avoid this this thinking altogether. And they do that same thing about um, AI. Yeah. And like, I think back to it wasn't that many months ago, right, where it was all over the news that some guy from Microsoft or Google was like. The computer talked to oh, me, yeah, the right? Google guy, yeah. Yeah, and like, oh, I think it's sentient, right? And yeah. people thought that was just so preposterous. Well, 
if you had a conversation with GPT chat and you didn't know it was GPT chat, yeah. you could be fooled by it very easily. Well, that already happens now. There's people getting on Tinder and using GPT chat and they're actually finding a way to optimize finding a mate through through AI. And, and like so there's like all these people saying like, hey, I, I noticed there was something weird in his responses. And so they start throwing out like, like little words to like trip up the, to see if it's a human or, or a chat bot essentially. Cause guys are like, well, you know, like I couldn't carry the conversation or I got bored with the conversation. And so I let this thing handle it until we got to the place where I wanted to go. And like, people are complaining about this now because they're finding, oh, I can optim like, oh, I can just use chat to like optimize my way to get a mate or whatever. And so like the problem is, is that like, there's been so many false alarms with like tech, like crypto is going to change the world and like virtual reality, like it's been going on forever. Right. And so people are kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know, but now it's like happening. <laughs> and the, the issue is that it's like, you know, it's like, it's like your lawn. Like you don't notice it's too long until one day you drive home from work and you're like, oh crap, I got to cut the lawn. Like, how did I get this long? And so that's where we're at. And now. I think that's a really good metaphor because there have been some wild changes that have happened in the yeah. world. But so many times it was like, this is really going to break everything. Yeah. And the inertia of what we had been doing was so powerful yeah. that the changes only look like they're on the edges. Right. And people don't realize, no, it's the core. It's the the rotation yeah. of the earth is changing. The core has already changed. Um, and now it's just a matter of like, when will people realize? And so that's, um, it's an interesting place. To, I mean, it, in some ways it's exciting. I mean, for me, like, I know... I'm like, I know who I am, right? And I know where I'm going. So for me, it's like, I'm not worried about it, right? But I'm like, wow, this is an interesting time to be alive. <laughs> and like, it's crazy. It's exciting. I mean, you feel like these energy shifts, like these vibe shifts, like um, all the time now. We are like, man, like the world feels like it's changed again, like since last year. Uh, and I think that's only going to accelerate into, um, and if people aren't prepared for that, it's, it's going to be madness. I mean, if you like, what we don't, what we haven't really seen yet is, um, uh, so Walter Ong, he was this, he's actually a St. Louis professor uh, from SLU, or he was, and he was a peer, a student of McLuhan, because McLuhan, most St. Louis guys don't know, he was a professor here, and that's where he wrote, like, Mechanical Bride, was at SLU, and um, he, Walter Ong had an inter interesting idea on, in, like, how we have to, like, um, arrange our sensorium, like, how we, like, the world changes, and then there's, there's a little bit of chaos or confusion, and what we have to do is kind of like rebuild our minds and how to perceive how the world has changed. And a lot, a lot of time that's due to technology, right? And um, which th that's the whole McLuhan thing. And so now we're grappling with AI and we're like, what does that do to us? And um, and I, don't, I think we're, we're figuring that out in real time. And you've got people who are like overreacting and then you've got people who just aren't reacting at all. They're like, eh, it'll be another fad that'll pass by. Um, but the thing is that we're in a new we're in a new world. And so we have to like, and it, things are moving faster. So we have to like reassemble our sensorium faster than before to catch up, to interpret what's happening and what might happen. Because now it's like where we might have had decades to, to react to technology. Um, now you don't. <laughs> and so now that's like a new way of looking at life. And so um, that's what we have to figure out right now, which is kind of scary for people. Yeah, you're a dad of many children. Yeah. You think about preparing them for a world in which, yeah. like, the, you know, you're going to be able to go to an AI to get any, any intellectual question you could yeah. possibly have, it'll be answered. So how do you help these children have skills that will make them valuable in a world where the sensorium is changing this fast? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's just a... So I've been on this, this kick of, like, creating, like, counter environments. So, like, how do, you, how do you react to modernity? And I think it's, like... Um, you know, it's like touching grass. <laughs> like, like you have to create these environments where like you can pull away from like the zeitgeist and like kind of like the maelstrom of the world and just like be alone with yourself. Uh, for, so for us, like, you know, um, just knowing who you are, like why you were made and like knowing who God is, I think are the most important things. Um, so that's like something we, you know, want our kids to know is, uh, you know, why did God make them? And I think that answers a lot of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, um, for, you know, a more, maybe a more tactical thing is my kids are like just becoming teenagers, my oldest ones. So like we, 
and we've never been like restrictive parents. Like we were never like, oh, screen time parents or gaming limits and stuff like that. We were just kind of like, hey, you know, like if we see something that we think is concerning, we'll, we'll react to it, but we're not going to like be proactive and force our kids to be like, you know, um, on some regimen. And so, but with social media, I think it was the first time ever we were like, hey, you know what? Like you guys don't get access to this until you're like a teenager, like an adult, <laughs> like until your brain is like more formed because you like, you know, you look at these these statistics of like, what is it like women, like girls and are like 140% more depressed than they were 10 years ago. Guys are 160% more, and there's more depression. 60% of undergrads now are like have a one or more like, like professional diagnosis for mental illness. Like the world is, is, is broken. <laughs> right. And what well, it's probably a multiple things It's probably like part of it, like is modernity saying you have to figure out who you are on your own terms there's no one else to help you because the institutions are all dead. Um, and uh, you have to define who you are, what you mean to the world, what you mean to yourself, uh, what religion is. And then also too, just like the social media mimetic cycles that are just causing people to like, uh, you know, just I, go into severe depression. <laughs> and so like all of that together is like, for me is like, okay, that one we're going to call out because that like, we know other homeschool, like we homeschool. So we like, we know other homeschool families and this is an anecdotal, you know, kind of observation, but like still like you can see the families at homeschool and they have their kids on social media and they have the same struggles with kids at school. And then you have kids who don't, you know, aren't on social media and go to public school or, or are homeschooled and they don't always have the same issues. I'm not saying that's like the cause, but there's something there. <laughs> there's certainly something there. Like, yeah. and I, you know, going back to the biblical references, I had a, a guy one time on my podcast just blow my mind by pointing out that the Garden of Eden is a metaphor for childhood, right? And you as a parent are to keep the children inside the walled garden for a while while they learn how to name the animals and you keep them safe. But eventually they are going to eat from the apple that tells them like, oh, wait, there's things that go wrong in the world and there are bad people. And, you know, you, once, the, once you lose your innocence, then you're out of the garden. To me, social media is like pulling a, a like an apple tree pipe into your Garden of Eden and just having yeah. it shuck uh, apples out <laughs> into your into your garden that that a child can pick up and eat. Yeah. You eventually they are going to have to do it. So if you don't give them any skills for how to handle yeah. it, you got a big problem. But getting them away from the apple you know machine for as long as possible is pretty important yeah um i think so and um i mean that's at least what we discovered for us and you know like my goal isn't to keep them sheltered or anything it's but it's like to like equip them to like when we feel like they're ready or you know if we're lagging and they feel like they're ready and you know then yeah whatever like and, and like for me it's like i don't like they're on discord and stuff like i don't mind them being on for there's like a difference between like forums and like other social media for some reason like forums i have no problem with and there's all kinds of crap on forums right but like it's like instagram and twitter and that and tiktok and stuff like those are the ones that i'm like there's something just not right and the first time i ever noticed that was when like our kids were young this is in 2010s like when we got them like youtube kids and like they would just get locked in these like cycles of like endless watching and you're like wow something it's like that app like hacked their brain. <laughs> like they're watching. And that was like when unboxing was new. And you're like, why did my kid just watch three hours of unboxing videos? Like something is like not right, <laughs> you know? Well, I was uh, doing a meditation not that long ago and I was sitting and one of the meditations I do is watch myself like the morning up until I got to the place where I'm meditating. Uh -huh. And I was watching myself be on YouTube flicking through the shorts uh -huh. and being like, now I've got like my, my perception is me watching as a camera of myself doing mm -hmm. these things. And you're like, man, that thing actually totally had grabbed me completely. Yeah. And I'm wandering around my house just going, it's a flip, soft drug. It, it is. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, a, it's a weird thing to see how much it can control you, but you are choosing to give yeah. it control. Like I woke up in the morning, I opened that app, yeah. I flipped it. And as I'm brushing my teeth and, and yeah, it's a Pavlog yeah. thing. Like you're like, Oh, my daily dopamine hit. I got to just swipe and not even consume media at this point. It's just like the muscle memory. <laughs> and, uh, and you don't notice that until you, I took a break from social, um, for like, I don't know, maybe a little less than two months. And, um, I didn't really, you know, I, I kind of figured like, I kind of anticipated what that would be like, but I did not really realize how crazy, how different your life is when you're not on 
and I didn't know media consumption except for like watching a couple movies with my kids. And, um, and then I got on Noster or whatever, you know, to check out that, what that was. But like, but the time where I had no media was crazy because I felt like I had just quit smoking. Like I didn't know what to do with like my mind. Like, it's like, you know, you take these like dumb tasks you know, you're walking down the hallway to get a coffee or you're going to doing laundry. You always fill that time with something like a podcast, a, a video, reading something real quick, it's texts. And when you don't do that, you're like, what am I supposed to do? And then like time just becomes like infinite for a minute. You're like, this is going to be the longest laundry duty ever. <laughs> but then eventually like, like you kind of break out of that like conditioning from media and you're like, wow, like I actually have time. I didn't even know this was possible. I have time to think about what I'm thinking. Like I could be like, like mulling over thoughts of like, oh, why did I think that? You know, like you have, and that's like what people call like clock time versus live time or whatever. And uh, clock time is the kind of like the, the, what modernity has done to us essentially like every minute counts, right? Like you're on the clock. Like even when you're waiting for something, you're still on the clock. Like you're, you're always giving up yourself to the clock. <laughs> and, and I was like, cause I felt like for a long time, you know, if I wasn't learning something like, like I wasn't, I was wasting the time. And because you're like, well, you know, pre so smartphones, like no one had infinite access to everything in the world. So it's like, they would be doing the same thing, you know, like I've got all of the world's knowledge available right here. I should be using it, you know, and it sounds good. You're like, oh yeah, I'm learning. This is a good practice. You oh, know? I can remember standing on a stage, uh, giving a talk and telling the audience like, yeah, of course I listen to everything on one and a half, sometimes two times yeah, speed. Yeah, of course. Because I got to get as much as possible. Right. Like I don't want to waste any moments. Right. And then you think about like how strong that pull is of, of your phone yeah. When you could be like watching your baby or your, your toddler in the bath and instead you're like, I'm just going to quick look at this thing on my yeah. phone. And you realize like, wait a second, like what am I giving up? What in these moments of the presence right. for that like little hit? But that little hit is like one of the most, I mean, easier to quit smoking than to quit doing that. Oh, absolutely. What was the, oh no, it was, I was thinking there was like, there's some rapper that was talking about how it's like harder to quit than Coke, but I think he was talking about sugar, which I guess is another soft drug that's in everything. But like, but it is like that. It, I, I definitely think it's harder to quit drugs than it would be a small, a smartphone because like, and actually my, my friend, his kid is like a teenager and they like, they disciplined him one time and they're like, we're going to take away your phone. And I remember like they had him stand like in this corner or whatever, like, and like, just put the phone over here. Like, you're going to spend like 15 minutes just like hanging out over there. And he just kept hearing the, the dings of like Snapchat and he was like, they said he started looking like a crack addict. <laughs> right? He was like, please, that one's actually important. That one's important. And they're like, whoa, like this is, this is scary. Like this is a crackhead, <laughs> you know, it's weird. And I don't mean to be like, I'm not a Luddite. Like I, I, I'm for the advancement of technology, but like, I think what we have to realize is like, oh, like we need to like learn what these tools are doing to us that we built. Um, you know, it's that classic line or whatever, like the tools use us. And that's what's happening. It's like, well, I think for the first time, like modern man is waking up to say like, oh, wow, like it's, it's taken us from like when, you know, since Marshall McLuhan first started coming out about this, so to finally realize like, oh, we see it now. Like we are being used <laughs> and it's evident. So, although I would say people from the enlightenment have been saying, hey, like technology is dangerous. Just, you know, not that you shouldn't use it, but like, there's something not right. <laughs> I have a brother-in-law and uh, he's married to my sister. They lead an intentionally simple life. And I remember talking with him about technology and him being like, yeah, I mean, maybe there's just some technologies we just shouldn't adopt. And me being like, <laughs> oh, yeah. so appalled by this idea. Yeah. Like, how could you not want to, you know, make things faster, no more, do all these things. And then like you hit a certain stage and maybe this is just the stage of, you know, yeah, getting aging, into your forties, right? Yeah. Like maybe you hit forties and you're like, wait a second. I, like we were talking before the cameras yeah. came on, like, oh man, I look in the camera and the, or in the, in the mirror and I realize like, oh, I actually can get old, yeah. right? Because for, it's for 40 years, it was just like, oh, I keep getting better and yeah. better and better and better. <laughs> and then one day you're like, oh, this doesn't happen forever. Yeah. And so time starts to change. But I now look back on my feeling about like more, bigger, faster, go, 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 yeah. go as being so foolish. But I don't think I could go back and talk 20 year old Vance out of that. No, I mean, part of it is probably age. Um, 
but also I think it was a product of like the environment we grew up in too. I mean, it was just, all of this was new. I mean, cell phones aren't even old, right? Like, so it's just like, we were trying to figure it out. But the problem is, is that we don't have the length of time, like I was saying earlier, like that we used to, like where you could like over a decade kind of reflect on what did the TV do to us, you know? It's happening too fast. Yeah, I don't sense, so my parents had seven kids, right? And they were busy, but I don't perceive them as being as busy as my wife and I are, right? Yeah. Like they just they just seem to have the pace of things was slower, the amount of time we had to do things. And part of that may be that we have both my wife and I run our own businesses. Yeah. And in my parents, it was my mom stayed home and my yeah. dad was there or was working. But like overall, it feels like they had more time. So this concept yeah. you're bringing up seems important to me. Yeah, I think time is very important. And and that was um, um, I don't I don't want to like talk about my own stuff very much, but like the um, the one the one thing I did where I like gave. I was like, what can I actually give God? I was thinking like the only thing I can actually like really give him that's a sacrifice to me was like my time. <laughs> and so like I sat in a spot for like two hours and I was like, this is your time. I'm going to give it. And even though it's like, it was a, you know, a set end and whatever, like I, I kind of like just did that. And I'm like, and the only reason why I did it is because I was living, I was like spending time in the Lake of the Ozarks for a while. There's like nothing to do out there. Um, and so I was like, I'm just going to sit on the lake on this rock. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to make this like a, I'm going to make, I don't know, like art, art bros got to like always like, you know, justify anything they do to be interesting with like making it an art performance or piece or something. Right. So like I was, that's what I did. I was like, I'm going to make this a performance for the Lord only. And I sat there and I'm like, wow, that was actually like probably the only thing I can think of that I can give God that was like really a sacrifice to me. Cause it was before, like, I really kind of like realized how important time was or like what media was doing to me. And so, um, I think that's like one thing that like people really need to figure out is like, is taking control of time and, and creating more, more like lived time in their life, because that's the only thing. And people have been saying this forever. It's the only thing that like, you can't get back. And so you can make more money, you can do whatever. Um, you can make up your money, whatever, but you can't get time back. And like you were saying with kids, I mean, man, like, I, that's why I'm kind of like, I wish people would have kids. Cause that's the first time you really realize time. <laughs> And you're like, wow, this kid is like old now. Like, what the heck? And uh, and those are gone. And so it's like, then you're like, well, dude, I would give up every moment of learning to get some of those moments back. And so time to me is like the most important, like physical element that we need to figure out how to like wrestle with. And we can really only understand it as like a metaphor in the same way that I can't give you the description of a smell and have you recreate yeah. it in your mind the experience of time can only be done yeah. as a metaphor. It's, it's so abstract to us too. Like we don't think about it. And I think also too, maybe people did think about it at one point, you know, you got bored, right? So you were conscious of time and now no one's bored ever. And well, being bored is painful, right? Like, yeah, it can be. I, I, uh, I, I remember when I was before phones happened, I, I was working in Denver and I was working by myself. I was renovating a house and uh, this was my first time of ever experiencing loneliness. And one of the things that I, I came to understand about loneliness, um, and it was a very valuable lesson for when I lived in the Peace Corps and you spend a lot of time by yourself. But the loneliness is not just like, I don't want to be alone right now. It is, I am afraid I am going to be alone <laughs> indefinitely or for yeah. huge expanses of time. And loneliness and boredom like yeah, our, yeah. our cousins or, or brothers or something like that. And I remember experiencing loneliness as a form of pain that was, I, I would have given, I would, I would have been like, Oh, if I could just smash my hand with a hammer and end this loneliness, like no problem. Yeah. And I think boredom is the mm. same way. And, and the fact that we can eradicate it with the soft drug right. is like, Oh, well that exactly yeah. what we're doing. I think it would be interesting if like even like a small thing that people could do is just like instead of like doing something stupid like sitting on a rock for two hours um, or getting rid of the Internet or whatever. It's just like just like when you're waiting for something like getting like a bagel or whatever or like just a phone call. Just like don't look at your phone in those like short minutes and you'll realize like the, it's better when you do it in a public place. Like you're going and you're like at a coffee shop waiting for a friend like not looking at your phone like you kind of feel stupid too because you're sitting there. And like, what is this guy doing? Like, what is he looking at? Like, is he, this guy's a creep. He's just like sitting there, you know, like what? 
you know, because everyone's on their phone or reading. But I don't think you'll ever, it, it's just like smoking if you're like, you know, the non-smoker says to the smoker, like, were you a smoker? By yeah, yeah. So, you know, the non-smoker's like, well, just smoke one less. And then yeah. just like slowly, and you're like, the smoker knows, oh, this is a fool's errand because yeah. I, I can't quit smoking by not having that morning one because I'm going to have two yeah. later on. If you're going to make some change with the relationship to yeah. your phone, or if I'm going to make a change to my yeah. my relationship with the phone, it would have to be a totalitarian situation. Yeah. Maybe. I, I guess the difference with smoking is that you know you're smoking and you know like the effects of smoking. With a phone, like most people don't. Maybe you're. Maybe people who listen to this are more aware. But like I think most people aren't aware that they're like doing a soft drug all day. And so like I think like that's where it's like they don't know what they're doing. It's just it's just a habit. I would say like I don't mean this pejoratively, but like I was saying like most boomers probably have no. I I find it funny because they were like the ones that originally were like the most critical of technology. And, but then at some point they became like the most avid users. Like my grandma's on Facebook, like all day, you know, <laughs> like I'm not on social as much as she is. They're always on their phone. I'm like, dude, these people are always online. Like they're more online than like the extremely online people are. It seems like. So oh, it's like, I agree with that. Like, and they leave all the dings and dongs oh, and whistles I, and everything on. And it's, it's just, just constant bombardment. Uh, like they're in the middle of like, of like, yeah, the zeitgeist. <laughs> and I'm like, how, how did this happen? You know? So you mentioned a social media platform. There's a certain irony in the fact that we're talking about, um, you know, having your phone and always being on and people are clearly listening to yeah. this on their phones right now. And then, uh, but there's also a social media that you and I are kind of interested in right now called Noster. Yeah. So how would you describe Noster, you know, to somebody that's completely uninitiated? Um. So I would say, I think maybe the easiest way is to say like, um, I'll give an example first. I would say like, it's, it's like if you took Twitter, but instead of you creating an account that lives on Twitter, their servers, you create an account, you have your own, they call them keys. You have your own keys that you own and then you plug them in to Twitter. And that way, when you log on, it's you logging on, not like your Twitter account going online. And that way, if you're like, hey, you know what? I don't like Twitter. I like this competitor that's just like Twitter, like Masson or something like that. I'm going to take my keys and I'm going to put them into that one instead. And so I'm Tyler again with all my data that I had put into Twitter. Now it's in this other one. Um, I would say maybe that's the best way to explain. I don't know. You're on there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that was good. I, I, uh, I oftentimes tell people like, uh, I, I, I often overcomplicate the description. You know, one of the things that's really important about Noster is the fact that you can move from one place and go to another and all the people that you were following, you get to keep following them and all the people that follow you get to stay with you. And this is powerful because it means like now the power is, is yours. yours. And the idea that you get to sign your transactions. So this public private key, the private key is the one that says, yeah, this is Vance. This is going to become really important right? because I think that, um, you know, we fed all of our emails to, to Gmail, even yeah. if you didn't ever write, go, log into to Google's system, any email that you've ever sent that has gone to yeah. a Gmail account is now processed through their system. They have every nuance of the way you write. Somebody can mimic you, right? Yeah, and the, the deep fakes that are going on, all of these things are going to allow computers to mimic you precisely at no effort at all, right? It'll just be like, hey, right, make a Tyler like bot. Zero cost. It's zero cost, <laughs> zero energy. Yeah. And so having a private key that yeah. allows you to plug something in to say, this is me, I think is going to become really important in the future. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's just not, and it's not just Twitter. It's like, you know, it's basically, it's like, it's taking like the underlying technology of a social media platform, which could be Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, uh, TikTok, et cetera. And it's just, it's just, it's like laying that experience on top of infrastructure. So it's like similar to email. So like you have a Gmail, um, but you could easily go and like create a Yahoo and it doesn't matter. You don't lose your email. Like you can't, you can still email me from any address from your, your Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail, whatever. You don't lose access to, to getting me. Um, and that's what Noster does is it's the protocol level um, so you're not, it's, it's not centralized at that point. It's, it's out there. It's a protocol. So, you know, you don't like, you don't like the Domus app anymore. You can scrap it and just go pick up another one and, and use that instead. And you still have access. And I, I, I agree with you. It, that's going to be super important, 
Um, so now that we've kind of given the the like basics, have you hooked up Lightning um, yeah. wallet to it? Yeah, I got super involved um, right right before Jack. I guess right around the time Jack Jack Dorsey got on is right right when I jumped on. My friend had been trying to get me on it for a while, and I was just kind of like not into it. I just was busy, and then Jack got on, and I'm like, all right, you know, um, I'll, I'll check this out. And so, uh, yeah, I was there from the beginning, or not the very beginning, but like. Uh, earlier and like lightning got instituted. And so I've, I've done some zaps. Like we've, I've gotten money from people. And so this is for, so what we're talking about right now is they, Bitcoin is actually a little bit cumbersome to use in an electronic space because the way that the blocks work, it's only every 10 minutes that a transaction can even go. It's kind of expensive. And so everybody had been saying, well, we wanted, we thought Bitcoin was the native currency of the internet. Yeah. Well, what Lightning is, is you put Bitcoin into a wallet and then you can do instantaneous transactions. Yeah. And then once somebody says, look, I'm ready to cash my Lightning out for Bitcoin, then you only make one transaction right. into the Bitcoin system that realigns where it's at. So it's essentially like having pocket change. Yeah. And by having Lightning hooked up to uh, the Noster protocol, it's fascinating Because now you can, instead of just giving somebody a thumbs up that says, hey, I really like that article that you wrote, you can be like, hey, here's 50 sats, which might be less than a penny, but it's a way for you to be able to say, I'm going to give you value because you took the time to create value. And this is going to, I think, change the nature of the relationship between content creators and content consumers because... I mean, I don't want to be advertised at all the time. I want yeah. to have a much better relationship where I'm giving value to somebody that creates something I want, but they aren't trying to sell me something yeah. underneath it. Yeah, I mean, or have to subscribe to like 50 different platforms, you know, because that's where it seems like it's going. It's like away from ads and towards membership stuff. Not everyone wants to have all that. So Zaps maybe, or like Lightning is probably the way to like still have a free service, but allow like people to make money somehow. And then also you can do like, they have what's called relays, which I'm, you know, I'm sure you know about, but like you can like subscribe to different basically communities essentially, and some can be paid. So if you want to make money, you can create a private relay and people can pay to be a part of that discussion that otherwise wouldn't get into your feed. So I think there's a lot of potential there. I'm also just kind of, I am, I am a little curious to see how it'll play out with like, can you imagine Twitter like being lightning based? Like it would be because social has its tendency to like, reward outrageous behavior like i do wonder if like like what is that going to look like are you just going to get like the biggest trolls making the most money oh that's interesting you know like that's the one concern i have about zaps uh, about lightning network um because now it's monetizing people to act a certain way so they're going to like veer their behavior a little bit likes does the same thing but it's just like money's got a stronger pull so I am yeah that's true and i mean in in the noster protocol like you would be able to put up anything you want and there's i mean particularly if you own your own relay yeah like it's not like twitter where twitter can roll in and be like oh oh, this account is breaking our rules we're going to shut her down right this is this is a a essentially a non-censorable decentralized system where you have a your own server your own relay that basically says hey anybody that wants to collect this information just point your yeah your app to this relay yeah and uh you're probably right. There are probably some really big downsides to this. Yeah, but it's worth it's worth experimenting with, I think. I, I think it is going to be super important. I think people should own, you're going to need to own your own way to communicate with people. Um, and I, I think ownership is going to become more and more important because it seems like like the Weltgeist is like kind of like wants to move you away from ownership right now, right? It's like, you don't, you know, you won't, you won't own anything and you'll be happy. Um, I, I think that like, this is a good way to figure out how to bring ownership into the digital space and allow, you know, remove the mediator, right? So that with lightning, like I just go direct to you, like it goes to your wallet immediately, no bank. So that's a great way to, to bypass a lot of things. And too. cutting out all of the middlemen that are taking a slice of that. I mean, right. the reason that you can't do micro payments on any other app it's is because you have a credit card company and they're yeah. like, well, that'll be two dollars and fifty cents yeah. to send that person three yeah. cents. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that uh the relays in Noster may give us a chance to take back some of the cloud um issues that are out there. Like right now, yeah. if I want to share, you know, any kind of photo, I've either got to upload it to Facebook and use right. that as my album maker. 
or I put it up on iCloud, and everyone should just recognize anything you have ever put on the cloud will 100% for certain be yeah. hacked and exposed to the entire yeah. world. There's no chance yeah. that it won't. And so like all these things that you're you're putting up there, including yeah. me, I'm, I'm not yeah. immune to it, but I would love to have it where if I wanted to store family photos, I would store it on my own family relay yeah. And that I could even have that server that is my family relay literally in my house. Right. And this making it's it's still got the benefits of having cloud, right. but it's owned by me. Yeah, I think eventually everyone's gonna have their own server in their house that it's got its own nose to relay and it's, you know, mining Bitcoin or I don't know, mining something. Um and I and I think that's important because yeah, if if networks go down, how you, you know, or if a, uh, Amazon owns like most everything that decides it doesn't like a certain po- part of the population or the government, you know, takes it over. You need to have your own backup essentially. Um, and, or, or even if you're not like on the, you know, if you're like, Oh, that sounds conspiratorial. Like just on the sheer fact that like anything that's out there is going to go away. Like you'll, you'll either lose access to it all or it'll be hacked. So it's like, why not just start, you need to start looking into it. So you don't have to like, become a hacker tonight, you know? Yeah, I have this uh, thing called the Articulate Ventures Network, and I am uh, most certainly going to have an an AVN relay and then hopefully just generally migrate over that way so that way we're not doing everything we've been doing on these, like, we pay for a platform, but all these places like Slack and Discord Mm -hmm. and all all of these things, like, they could just say, like, you're no longer a user. Yeah. Anytime you log in from this IP address, we shut you down. Right. And being able to get around this is increasingly important because it is going to come down to like some some level of freedom, right? Your yeah. your dependence on a free service will determine whether or not you are allowed to play in the in the large sandbox. Yeah. I mean that and that's that's just how it goes. Like those are the rules that they wrote and so you're playing by the rules. So you kind of have to expect like people get all upset about that stuff. Like, oh, this is a free speech platform. It's like it's a company. You know? Yeah, it's a private <laughs> like, company. They can do what they want. Yeah. So you just got to know that going in. So you can complain all you want, and that's fine. I think people are allowed to complain about it, but um, at the end of the day, it's not your decision. So why not own it instead? Well, Tyler Matthews, this has been a fantastic conversation. If uh, if people wanted to see stuff that you're interested and in into, would you have a place you'd direct them? Um. Yeah, I mean, I guess they could, um, if, if anyone's interested in reaching out, talking about geeking out about any of this stuff, uh, you know, my website's probably pretty good. Uh, it's just Tyler, Tyler Matthews, but uh, the domain is, you know, dot WS. So Tyler, M-A-T-H-E dot W-S. And then I'm on Twitter, but I'm, I'm pretty, I'm like an online, I'm like a, I'm pretty like performative on Twitter. So it, it might kind of come off kind of weird, uh, like to like Artie or something, but uh, I'm on there pretty often, but I'm a normal guy normally. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to put my pub key in the in the show notes. So. Yeah, I'll put mine out there. I'm not as super active on Nosters as I used to be. Um, we're moving, so like I have a little time for a lot of this stuff. But uh, yeah, my I think my pub key's on my website too. So great right there. Well, thanks, man, for yeah. coming on. Yeah, thanks a lot. This was a lot of fun. Appreciate it. Ah, ah, ah.